I wanted to transition into uh, not a series, but I wanted to transition into a message that God has been putting on my heart. Primarily because we as a church are getting into a season of prayer. Uh, and why I say that is because without prayer, we cannot expect God to move. Uh, and I want to be very, very, very strong with that statement because that is a statement that applies to not just our church, but also to your lives, to my lives, to your children, so on and so forth. Uh, I'm here to tell you that there is power in prayers. Um, the Bible tells us that. Ask and you shall receive. That's what the Bible tells us. Uh, James actually tells us that we do not have because we do not ask. Uh, there is power in the Christian uh, that, that comes out of his supplication and prayer that he renders before God. As I go through this message today, I want you to put your life in context and ask yourself where in your life you need to make adjustments it could be in your prayer life. It could be in your life of dedication to God. It could be the time that you're giving to God. But more than anything else, I pray that we will be reoriented to what prayer really means and the essence of prayer in our lives. And I want to give you five, five points, if I have the time, uh, to, to, to show you and teach you from the Lord's Prayer as to what the essence of prayer is and what Jesus wanted to teach us as his children about prayer, as Christians about prayer. Go with me to Luke chapter 11 and verse 1. And the disciples are looking at Jesus and they are making a statement and they say, Jesus, would you teach us, or Lord, Rabbi, teacher, would you teach us how to pray? Teach us how to to pray. Uh, the first point I want to leave with you this morning, and if you have been following our teachings over the last few months, uh, uh, we, we follow a very uh, exegetical uh, style of teaching where we take scriptures and we break it, up, we break it down. Uh, I explain them uh, from an exegetical point of view where we take out the meaning from scripture, we take out underlying meanings, but more than that, we also blend it in with an expository way of teaching where we will only teach from the Bible. Uh, you will never find me on a Sunday morning standing here and preaching from a book. You will never find me preaching from a blog, uh, from something somebody said, from a movie clip, uh, etc., etc. You will always find me going to the Word of God and dissecting the Word of God and understanding it first and bringing it to you and showing to you what God has been speaking to me. And throughout this week, I've been praying about, talking about prayer before we get into the season of prayer. And in Luke chapter 11 and verse 1, the Bible says, Lord, teach us to pray. Point number one, powerful prayer fills you with power. Now, if you look at the book of Luke, uh, Jesus has been on this ministry spree, if I can call it that. He has been on this uh, one after one, uh, after he got baptized, he started his ministry, right? He heals this leper. We see this first miracle that he does where he heals this leper. Uh, he goes on to this paralyzed man. He heals him. He goes on to the centurion's servant, and the centurion's servant, centurion is like, hey, Jesus, I need you to come and heal my servant. So he's done that already. Uh, he goes to the widow's son, the widow's home, and he, and he raises the widow's son from the dead. He's in the situation where there's storms around him and he calms the storms and says, storms be still. And, he, and, and everything responds, nature responds to him. We see soon after that he goes and he prays for a man that is possessed by demons and he casts those demons out and those demons, they flee. And then like we spoke about last Sunday, there's this woman with the issue of blood that comes up and, she, and he, she looks at Jesus and says, Jesus, I need your touch. Goes and touches the hem of his garment and is instantaneously healed. And then we have Jairus' daughter and immediately after that in Luke chapter 11, man, the disciples are in awe. They're in wonder. They're like, man, this guy is up to something, right? We're, we're hanging around the right guy. But more than anything else, what they want to know is Jesus Lord, would you teach us how to what? Pray. He doesn't say, Lord, would you teach us how to do miracles? That's great. That's, that's wonderful. That's correct. That's what we need to pray. God teaches how to heal. They didn't want to ask Jesus, Jesus, would you tell me how to cast out the demon? Would you tell us how you did that crazy thing where you stood in the middle of the boat and asked the winds and the waves to abate? No, 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 nothing of that sort. They had seen it all. 
But that's not what they wanted to learn. What they wanted to learn at that moment was, Jesus, would you teach us how to pray? Why was that? Why did they ask him about prayer? Because they somehow understood that the secret behind his ministry and the effectiveness of his ministry and the effectiveness of his productivity was rooted in this beautiful thing called prayer. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Everywhere they went, they saw Jesus praying. In every opportunity Jesus got, he detached himself. He went up the mountain. He moved away from the disciples. He, he stepped away. He rested. He, he wanted to pray. There are numerous examples in the Bible. In Luke chapter 3 and verse 1, the Bible says, when Jesus was baptized and was praying, the heavens were open. Right? The Bible talks about that and says, man, when, as he was getting baptized and as he was praying, the heavens opened. A lot of us as Christians, we pray for open heavens, but we don't pray. The Bible is very clear in that. Jesus, it says, the Son of Man stood in the middle of the water. And as he was praying, as he was interceding, as he was talking to his Father in heaven, the Father in heaven responded with open heavens. I'm prophetically speaking to some of y'all here today, and I'm encouraging you, if you want to see open heavens in your life, in your education, in your job, in your family, whatever you're going through, I urge you, start pushing through in prayer, because there is power in prayer. Can I hear an amen? They saw this. They, they saw when, 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 before he picked his disciples in Luke chapter 6, the Bible says Jesus went up on a mountain to pray, and he prayed to God his Father, what? All night, not five minutes, not 10 minutes. And for us, for some of us, it's like, whoa, all night, didn't he want to sleep? But for Jesus, he knew that the power behind his effectiveness as a minister, as Jesus, as God himself in the form of man, he knew that his power came out from keeping in touch with his Father in heaven. You know, they always say this. They say, uh, who you talk to has a big impact on you. They say, the more you talk to somebody, the more impact they have on you. The more you talk to somebody, they rub off on you. My question to you is, how much are you talking to Jesus? Because if you do a lot of talking to Jesus, he's going to surely rub off on you as much as you're talking to him. He's going to have an impact in the way you talk. He's going to have the impact in the way you operate your life, the way you treat other people, the way you go about living your life. Right? Luke chapter 5 and verse 16, the Bible says this, but Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. He withdrew. He he took time to go and he took time to pray. And all these people, these disciples were observing this day in and day out. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 18, one day Jesus left the crowds to pray alone. Only his disciples were with him and he asked them, who do people say I am? If you want it, If you want people to know about Jesus, pray. Because Jesus is coming out of his prayer room and the question that he wants to ask his disciples is, guys, who do people say I am? Are they looking at me as somebody that is spending? It's it's powerful what prayer can do. And I'm reading through these scriptures because of how important it is. Luke chapter 9 and verse 29, this is what the Bible says. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was transformed and his clothing became dazzling white. I want to tell you something. Prayer changes people. Prayer should not change God. For a lot of us, we feel like prayer should change God. But that's why I have point number one that says powerful prayer fills you with power. The reason for prayer is to change me. The reason I pray is because my heart needs to be changed. Am I talking to somebody here? The reason I pray is not to change the mind of God. The reason I pray is not to bend God's plans. It's not to force God's plans. It's to say, God, your plans are supreme. And I just need to reposition myself and get myself ready for what you have in store for me. So prayer is not for God. Prayer is not to change the mind of God. Prayer is to position yourself in a place where you can submit him, yourself to his will. And that's why the Bible says the moment Jesus stopped, the appearance on his face was transformed. That's what prayer needs to do to you and me. It needs to instill a power inside of you that is, that, that, that is unsurpassed. People should know that you're a man and a woman of prayer. There are so many people that I meet, man, and I talk to them for five minutes and 10 minutes, and I know that they are a praying person. 
Haven't you met those people? Man, anything you talk to them about, you spend five minutes with them, at the end of those five minutes, they're going to look at you and say, can I, can I pray for you? Can I, can, can I say a word of prayer for you? And there, those, and there are those people that look at you constantly, the people that have to pour into your lives, and they look at you and say, hey, uh, I've, I've been praying for you. You're on my thoughts. You're, you're in my mind. And, and those are the people that you know have a constant attitude of prayer in front of God. And Jesus was exactly that. And the reason his disciples asked him, Jesus teaches how to pray, is because they understood that the power he's operating under is his ability to go into the presence of God and have a conversation with his father. How many of you seize an opportunity to talk to God every single moment of the day? Powerful prayer fills you with power. The power that Jesus had to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to heal the leper, right? To, to set people free from their bondages, to look at the demon possessed and say, be set free. The power that was inside of him was the power that was given to him by his father in heaven. And that is what they were talking about. And that's what the disciples came up to him and said, there's no other better person than can teach us, but the person that is prayerful himself. Surround your, your, yourself with people that pray. I don't know about you, but man, I try my best to be around people that pray because I know they will always cover me in prayers. I always make sure that I let my mom know, hey mom, this is what's going on because I know I don't even have to ask her to pray. There is this attitude of prayer and the spirit of prayer that she has that she discerns and knows that this is what I need to pray about. This is how I need to pray about it. Associate yourself with people that pray. Keep in touch with people that pray. Point number two, real quick. Prayer is an optional. Prayer is necessary. Am I talking to somebody? Verse number two, Luke chapter 11 and verse number two, we're expositionally studying this passage. I'm not, I don't have time to go through the entire thing, but Luke chapter 11 and two, and this is what the Bible says, and he said to them, when you pray. Can I make a statement? Prayer is an absolute necessity for the believer. It's not an option to consider. It's not something you do if you have spare time. It's something you do by default. It is your default setting as a Christian. Am I talking to somebody? That's your fuel on which you run. And that's what Jesus said, when you pray. He didn't say, if you pray. He doesn't say, when you got time, man, when you pray, this is, no, 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 no. He says, what? When you pray. There's power in that, in which Jesus is assuming that you're praying already. But when you do pray, this is what you, are you understanding what I'm saying? By default, you and I as believers have to understand that. Luke 18 and verse 1, the Bible talks about that. And then, and Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. How many of us pray in a way that we don't give up? Hannah in the Bible, the Bible talks about that woman, man, a ferocious woman of prayer that just keeps praying and praying and praying and praying. People call her dumb. People call her stupid. People call her names. People think that she's out of her mind. People diagnose her with bipolar and depressive disorders. But she's looking at all of them and saying, oh, it's not your son you're praying for. It's my son. This is between me and my God, and I shall pray till I get my answer. Can someone say amen this morning? People around you don't understand what you're going through, Jared. It's about you and your relationship with God. If there's something you're praying about, you better not stop praying about it. You know what I'm talking about, Ronnie. Those 21 days last week that you just got done, the 21 days of turmoil, those 21 days of pain, only you knew the pain you were going through, but you knew there was power in prayer. And then the 21st day, that week was when you got a job but none of us will go through that pain because we don't know that pain. But there are some people that are going through pain in this, in this room. There's some things you're praying for. I'm like, encouragement to you is this. Don't stop praying. Pray without ceasing. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17, the Bible reminds us that pray without ceasing. Always pray. Always pray. God may not always answer your prayer, but he always listens to them. Am I talking to somebody here? He doesn't always say yes. He doesn't always say yes right now. Sometimes you pray and man, you get instantaneous results. But sometimes God tables your prayer. And he says, I got it. I got your email. I got your prayer request. But hey, guess what? I'm not going to answer it right now. You're not going to get a deliverance right now. Abraham, how many years do you have to wait, Abraham? Right? He tabled that for how many years? Not one, not two. We know, we, know, we know that. Hannah, you're not going to get it immediately. 
But then we look at that, that woman that approached Jesus last week, touched the hem of his garment, and the Bible says, and immediately. But she also waited what? Am I talking to somebody? Sometimes there's waiting involved, but his, his, his delay is not a denial. His delay is not God looking at you and saying, no, I, 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 I don't got your back. He's like, I got your back all the time. You can pray, keep praying, because that's what yields results. Point number three, point number three. Praying is acknowledging the Father. Praying is acknowledging the Father and who He is. Verse number three, this is what the Bible says. Um, or is it, is it verse number, uh, actually let me, go, let me go to six and verse nine. Um, Matthew chapter six and verse nine. We'll come back to verse number three. Uh, Matthew chapter six and verse nine. Go with me over there. I want to read this, this real quick. And this is what the Bible says. It says, Our Father, pray like this, Jesus said, Our Father in heaven. If you go to Luke chapter 11 and verse number, uh, verse number 3, the Bible says this. It says, um, where are we? we say, it says, give us this day, give us our food uh, day by day, right? It says that. But in verse number 2, it says, and this is the prayer he taught them, Father that are in heaven, like our Father who are in heaven. So both those passages, I'm, I'm drawing a parallel to show you the difference between the two passages and how Jesus prayed on two different occasions and how two different gospel writers accounts it and how the power in both of these accounts are so good, right? So here in Luke chapter 11 and verse 2, this is what the Bible says, and, and when you pray, pray this way, and he says, our Father who art in heaven, praying is acknowledging the Father, acknowledging where he is, in relation to where you are. You know what makes prayer different from counseling? You know what prayer, what, what makes prayer different from talking to a friend about what you're going through? You know what makes prayer different from you getting on the phone call and venting? What makes prayer different is you're talking to somebody who's not in the same realm as you are. You're talking to your father who art in I'm not talking to somebody that is human like me, that's going through the same issues. Not that I'm saying that it's wrong. Not that I'm saying that you shouldn't pray for, because the Bible says pray for one another. It's not that I'm not asking you to get the support of other people, but there's something about directing your prayer to the one who created you, who knows you, who knows every hair on your head, and to call him Father. Come on, somebody, this is good. To say, my father who art in, not on this earthly realm where there is pain, where there is suffering, where all of this is there. No, 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 no. I am praying to my father who is in heaven. Jesus encouraged that. And he said, you know, I, I, I want you to pray to the father. God, you, God the father, you're in heaven and I'm, I'm on earth. Prayer is this bridge that connects earth to heaven. Because in John chapter 16 and verse 23 to 24, this is what the Bible says, in that day, you will ask nothing of me. In what day? Today. That's what we're talking about. Uh, Jesus was talking about the day after he would leave and he would send his Holy Spirit. So we're referring to this day. Truly, I say unto you, listen to this. Whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be what? Full. Jesus looks at us as his children and says, man, you need to pray. Pray to the Father in heaven. But use whose name? Use my name. There are a lot of people that, that pray to the Holy Spirit. Not that it's wrong. The Holy Spirit is God. He's one of the Trinity. A lot of people that pray to, uh, you know, Jesus. Not that that's wrong. He's God. But Jesus himself teaches us how to pray. And he says, when you pray, you pray to whom? Our Father. You say, Father God, I come into your presence in the name of Jesus. 
You pray to the Father through the name, with the name of Jesus, through the help of the Holy Spirit. And that is how you and I pray. But you got to acknowledge the Father in heaven and who he is in your life, right? Dear Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus, right? In, 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 in that day is what it says. Right now, that's how we need to pray. It's coming to the presence of God every single time. Romans chapter 8 and verse 15, the Bible says this, For you did not receive the power of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, what? Abba, Father. We were lost. We were neglected. We were dejected. We were, we were going towards destruction. But the Bible says, man, we were adopted into the kingdom. And because of that, we have a father that we can call up to. And we can say, Abba, Father. Galatians 4 and verse 6 says this. And because you are sons... God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father, it continues to teach us about how important it is for you and I to acknowledge the role of the Father in heaven, the creator, the one that created the heavens and the earth, the one that looks at you and says, man, I have created you unique. I knew you before you were born in your mother's womb. Before you, I knew you and I knew your past and I will always know you. That God, that Father in heaven is the one that we're praying to. He knows what you're going through because he is not on your realm. Prayer was always centered around the Father and Jesus wanted to teach us that. He wanted to teach his disciples that. He said, yeah, I'm here, but you pray to the Father in my name. You tell him that I sent you. you you're coming on behalf of me. Prayer revolves around the relationship that a child has with its father. And man, today, if you have a relationship with Jesus, any point of time, you can just approach the throne room of God and you can call him Father and he will answer your prayers and he will love on you and he will tell you that he is listening. Luke chapter 11 and verse 13 says this, If then you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Man, it begins with talking to the Father and it ends with receiving from the Father. You got to understand that when you and I talk to the Father on a regular basis, when we pray, when we acknowledge Him and His power, His omniscience, His omnipotence, man, you're looking at God and saying, God, I am asking you because I can't. Prayer is about changing who you are and saying, God, I am helpless, I am worthless, but you are the one that makes me worthy. It's that bridge. It's the bridge. It's important to see God as a father. Why is it important? Because, man, many of us, we see God as, as an employer. What do I mean by that? Some of us uh, have an employer-employee relationship with God that says, God, if I do this, you owe me this. Am I talking to somebody? It's, God, I, I work hard for you. I, I preach on Sunday mornings, God. So Monday morning, God, I want, I want a good week. I don't want any issues. I don't want, I don't want anybody falling sick in my church. I don't want to deal with any pastoral issues, God, because I am preaching for you. I am doing your work. Am I talking to somebody? <laughs> what kind of prayer is that? The Bible talks about it and it says those are foolish prayers. I can't pray like that. Because at that point in time, I'm treating my God as my employer to whom I'm saying, God, the merit on which I'm standing is that I'm doing something for you. Hence, you got to do something for me. I scratch your back, you scratch my back. God's like, no, that's not the relationship that, that, that's there in prayer. The relationship is one of a father. And, and why that's powerful is I'm coming to that in just a second. Some of us treat God like a vending machine. We have a vending machine relationship. And we go up to God and say, I put my tithes, God. I put my offering, God, every month, same time, same day. I put on auto pay, God. I expect you to come through for me. Hello? And what happens when you don't get the Coke? Bam! 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 Right? I need to take video of you guys when you're in front of vending machines sometimes. You get so frustrated. It doesn't work. Arr! My one dollar. Right? Get so, has anybody lost a dollar in a vending machine ever in your lives? You know how that frustration can be. I'm, I'm really, fr even though it's like 50 cents or a dollar, I'm pretty frustrated that I didn't get what I what paid for. 
And some of us treat God like a punching bag. Every time he doesn't hear your prayer. Some of us threaten God. I, I, I used to do that. Every time God never answered my prayer, God, I'm not going to go to church next Sunday. God's like, I don't care. Like, dude, you think you're going to hurt me if you don't go to church next Sunday? You go to church next, next Sunday for you. That's what you go for, not for me. I'm still going to be on the throne. I'm still going to be God. I, 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 nothing changes that. I am the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Don't, don't think that I don't hear. But, but your perspective of God needs to change to, to, for, for, from that of, a, oh, he needs to do this for me, or he owes this to me, to, God, you're my father in heaven. It's, it's a different dynamic. We need to start treating God like a genie that when we rub the lamp, we get three wishes. Some of us treat him like that. You're like, God, like, you're like a genie, God. Whenever I ask you, you better show up. That's how it is. When I pray, you better appear out of nowhere. I better have an epiphany every single time I pray, God, because if not, oh, you're not God. And God's like, I don't want to be treated that day, that way, man. Some, you know, whatever way you view God, when you see God as a father, man, there's a different dimension of embracing that you do. It's a personal thing. It's a thing that says, oh, he's got me. He is my daddy. He, he, he made me. He created me. He knew me before I was even born. He knows how many hair. I, oh, come on, somebody. You better. This is good. Because here's the thing about children. Here's the thing about, they don't have worry. None of your children are worried about if they will be fed that evening or not for dinner. They know when they come home, they're going to have a snack ready for them. Am I, am I talking to? Does Levi ever come home and is he like stressing about having milk uh, ready for him? I don't know if he does milk and cookies, but whatever. Is he, are you worried, Levi, ever that you will come and not have snacks? No, he doesn't. He's like, mom got my back. She's going to go to Walmart. She's going to make sure I have what I need. Kids don't live in worry. That's the relationship I have with God, where I look at him and say, my father, you got my back, God. All this worrying that I'm doing, I just need to talk to you and say, I know you are here. That's why he looks at him and says, God, give me my daily bread. Not God, oh, I'm going to struggle. I'm going to sweat. I just ask, God, and I know you're going to provide for me. That relationship is a different relationship, y'all. When you acknowledge his, that's what the Bible says. When, when you pray, pray to your father, right? Kids are programmed in such a way that, that they don't know how big people do things and they don't want to understand, right? They, they don't want to know the complexities of your job. They don't want to know how your boss is treating you. The, all they want to know is they're taken care of, right? And, and sometimes we spend too much time trying to think about the mind of God and God's like you're my child relax in my presence I got your back all you do is talk to me I just need to have conversations and us parents like that when our kids get on our phones you're like put your phone down and look at me while I talk to you that's all God wants you to do sometimes man take your focus of the things that don't matter and focus on him and say father I love you Father, I want to give you, and that's what the Bible says, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Just acknowledge his holiness. Say, God, you are holy. Sometimes prayer is just that, Ariel. You just go into the presence of God for five minutes and talk about you knowing that he is God. Acknowledging what a mighty and a powerful and a great God he is. That's what prayer is. You acknowledge that he's perfect, that he is good and he's holy and he's different than who you are. That is what makes God be pleased. Luke chapter 11 and verse 2, the Bible says this, and he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be thy name, your kingdom come. Your will be done. When you pray for heavenly things, that's your prayer. God, this is what I want. These are probably things that I'm praying for. But God, not my will, but your will be done. Every single day when Jesus got into the presence of God, it was not God. God, I want a car. I want the uh, house. I want to feed the 5,000 tomorrow. Make sure that I have the bread. No, 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 no. It was more of him looking at God and saying, God, you're a holy God. 
Thank you for sending me to this earth to do what, Lord, you have asked me to do. Give me the power. Give me the ability to be able to defeat temptation every single day. His prayer was basically, Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, God. There are things that I want to do as a human, but God, give me the ability to fight it every single day so that I will put your will before my desires and my will. Let your will be done, not my will, God. Point number four, intercession is key. Intercession is key. In Luke chapter 11, verses three and four, the Bible teaches us this. It says, give us this day or each day our daily bread, right? Our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, not me. Forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone, everyone who is indebted to us, us, again. It's not the singular, it's a plural. Prayer is about intercession. And lead us not into temptation, for deliver us from the evil one, for understanding what I'm saying. There's this beauty in prayer that when you take the focus out of you, because this, this is, it's so evident in prayer that we're like, God, my family, my kids, my church. No, no, no. Let's start changing our focus of prayer and saying, God, the body of Christ, like us, God, I pray for my name, like I pray that we as a church will intercede and put other people before you put yourself in place. Love your neighbor as much as you. I pray that we will come around that mindset. Pray for one another. James warns us in James 4 verses 2 and says, you desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. Verse 3, this is what I want to talk about. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your pleasures or your passions. And he says, guys, make prayer about God And let prayer be about people around you. Like pray for people, intercede for people. Don't put yourself ahead of other people. Pray for us. Let it be about people around you. Pray for our government. Pray for our leaders. Pray for your neighbors. Pray for people that you that need to know of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Have a burden and have a heart for people that you need to intercede for. As a church, we're getting ready for a season of fasting and prayer. The week of the, of, of the, the third weekend, the week of October, October 28th, we turned one year old as a church. We launched October 28th last year. And we've been in this journey of faith for one year and, and we've been building blocks. It's this, uh, have, have you ever built blocks and you, you, you build a few of them and it comes crashing down, right? Uh, Sometimes it's like building blocks and sometimes there are hiccups and there are falls and there's pain and there's suffering and and, and you wonder, God, are we supposed to do this? But God in his mercy shows us time and time again that he is in this for us and and he shows us that in in divine ways and he's growing our church. But he started talking to me recently and said, Ashish, the church is not gonna grow until every person comes together on their knees in surrender to God. And I had to pray about it, and God said, one week. So I think it's the 21st. I don't know what the date is. Somebody can remind me. The 21st through the 26th. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Hopefully the, these guys open up their doors for us, and we can rent this place out. But uh, every single evening, we're going to come here. Okay? I'm, I'm giving y'all notice so y'all can plan this ahead. Uh, it's not compulsory. I'm not going to, you know, say that you're not ever welcome here in commission. If you don't come to prayer, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm asking and urging you, please block that week off. After work, we have it from 6.30. And we just want to come into the presence of God and just spend time in prayer. It's going to be a spiritual saturation week where we're going to be filled with the Spirit of God. We're going to allow the Spirit of God to take over our church and allow God to grow the church because you know this is not my church. It's not your church. We're just workers. It's His church. He's the head of the church and He's going to grow it. But He just needs some people to just come to Him and surrender in prayer and pray for people around us. 
in a few moments, we're going to do communion as a church. I want you to remember there are so many people around here that need to come and join us in, in, in taking this to celebrate the life and death of Jesus Christ. But man, they're lost. They, don't, they haven't heard the gospel. There are so many unchurched. There are so many de But God has given us the mandate to reach out to them. But it's not going to be possible without prayer. I pray that God will give us ashy knees once again. God will give us ashy elbows once again, man, because we can get into the presence of God and we need to seek his face. Point number five, I'm going to close with this. Luke 11 and verse 5, the Bible says this, and he said to them, which of you have a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing set before him. Verse 7, and he will answer from within, do not bother me, the door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. For those of you who have children can kind of identify with that. Once your kids are in bed, you just want to keep them in bed, right? It's, it's pretty difficult, right? And, and that's what he's trying to say. He's like, what are you doing? Hush, get out of here. Verse 8, I tell you, though he will not get, get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. You know that word impudence is so powerful here. Jesus is teaching us how to pray and he says, you got to pray with impudence. I'm sure that word goes like, right above the heads of a lot of people sitting over here and it probably did for me as well initially when I read it. I knew what it meant, but I was like, what? Pray with impudence? That means gall. That means insolence. That means rudeness and sass. And that means uh, audacity and cheekiness and with a nerve. Jesus, you want us to pray with a nerve? You want, no, but, but the underlying meaning of that is Bold. He says, it's the man. We can't understand the story from a Western concept, but from an Eastern concept, which is a, which is a, a background of generosity and, and people that are very hospitable. Uh, people just show up at random times. You don't need people to call you and let you know that they're coming into town. They'll come to town, knock on your door and say, hi, surprise, and you just have to be ready for them. And that's how our Eastern culture works many of the times, right? And we have unexpected guests, and this dude, they don't have a 24-hour Walmart right, that he can run to and get bread from, and he's like, oh, I need bread, and he says, man, not, not two pieces of bread, he goes and asks them for what? Three loaves of bread. I'm like, how much bread can a person eat, right? But he wants three loaves, and in the middle of the night, he's like, knock, knock, can I have, but, but here's the thing, this man would not have given it to him, but he gave it to him because of his persistence and his grit and his nerve. Oh, come on, somebody, um, this is kingdom principles I'm teaching you. Something that Jesus taught us. This man is asking boldly. You know, you know what a father does to a child? No matter how much of the middle of the night it is, right? Fathers, you can identify with this. No matter how much you're sleepy and tired and you have to go to work the next day, wake up at six. If your daughter wakes you up at three and says, Dada, I want water. Guess what you're doing? Do you look at her and say, go back to sleep or I am going to put you in timeout? Nope. If she <laughs> we have some kids uh, in the house today that are saying, yes, that's what happened. But my, my Mickey, I have a three-year-old, Michaela, and, and, and she wakes up at three in the morning. And I, I, I promise you this is what happens, right? Dada, I want water. I'm thirsty. I'm like, Mickey, are you sure you are thirsty yeah, I want, I want water. I was like, okay, okay, okay. I don't want you to wake up the other one. I'll go get you water. So here I am, you know, I'm bumping into stuff, hurting my knee, you know, bumping my head, having bruises all over. The next morning I'm looking and I'm like, where am I hurting? And I realize I'm walking in my sleep and hurting myself. And I'm going, getting her water. And she doesn't want water. She wants cold water. She's very particular about what she wants. And I'm like, impudence, like the gall that she has to tell me that she wants a particular kind of water. And she, she wants that cold water. And unless I bring it, like, and, and here's what frustrates me. I bring it to her. And the first time I brought it to her, she was like, I don't want it. Ooh, I was mad. It changes. Every day it changes. One day she was like, yeah, I want it, Dada. I want the water. And I, I brought it to her and I gave it to her. And she took one little sip, like, okay, I'm good. I'm like, Oh, Jesus, give me patience, give me love. Let me, remind me I'm a pastor. 
a good father. But here's what you do when a child, and that's the amazing thing. He's like, I'm your father, and you're my child, and it can be three in the morning, and you might have impudence, and you might have the gall to wake me up, but you know what? I'm still your daddy, so guess what I'm going to do? I'm still going to wake up, and I'm going to still come to you, and I'm going to ask you what you want, because I'm your father. The sheer audacity that this man had. You know what Hebrews says? Hebrews 4 and verse 16 says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace. With confidence. When you pray, pray boldly. You might not see it, but keep praying and keep praying and keep asking because Jesus said, keep praying. You know, that's why in Matthew 7 and 7, it says this in the New Living Translation, keep on asking. This is the translation we're used to. Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. But you know what the actual Greek is over there? The actual Greek transliteration is this in the New Living Translation. Keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be opened to you. There's this sense of constant pursuing and knocking and saying, God, I ain't going to give up till you show up. Thank you, Jesus. Because that's what I have, the confidence inside of me. And that's point number five is pray boldly. Pray boldly. When you pray, come into the presence of God and say, God, I'm praying to you, my Father in heaven, who can come to me at any time. I know, God, I'm your child, and you will never say no to me. And my daughter knows that. It's very hard for daddy to say no to to her, especially if something that I promised her. Fathers, you know how it is. John, if you could come up and help me. Uh, You know how it is. If you promise your child something, the other day I promised my child, I said, if you go to school, which she's struggling with because it's the first time she's going to school. I said, if you go to school and if you don't cry the whole day and if you eat your lunch, three conditions. When you come back home, you can go to the pool. Guess what? From the time I took her to school, and I said this in the weekend, so uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, she's, she's basically having this, this thing is in her head, I need to behave well at the pool, and guess what? From the morning, she wakes up, Dada, am I going to the pool this evening when I come back from school? Yes, you are, baby. Yes, you are. And guess what? From the time she came back home and I got a good report from a teacher saying there was no crying, she ate her lunch and everything, she was so happy and she comes up to me. This is, this is what she does. She comes up to me and says, Dada, can I go to the pool? <gasps> That's her face of excitement. She has this wide open, <gasps> and she shakes. How can a father say no to that? You know why? Because her asking was based on a promise. Guess what? Your father in heaven has given you promises galore. You pick up this word and you tell me if there is a promise that doesn't apply to you. You know what? There are promises in here that you and I can take a hold of and say, God, if you said it, you will do it, God. And I know you will. So God, I hold you to your promise. I'm going to ask you day after day because your word tells me, keep on asking. Your word tells me, keep on seeking. Your word tells me, keep on knocking. So guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to keep on doing it till I get my answer because that's what you said that's what prayer is don't you dare give up I know what you're going through there's some people that want to give up in in whatever you're going through don't you dare give up because he hasn't given up on you don't you dare give up would you stand up to your feet with me this morning man God is good amen